There it is. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, Greg had asked me if I wanted to continue teaching 1 Corinthians 14. And I thought that's the, uh, the perfect uh, place for, uh, for him to continue, <laughs> not for me to jump into the middle of. And uh, so I'm going to leave 1 Corinthians to him. He's doing a wonderful job. And, uh, and I was glad, uh, just you wouldn't know this, but uh, I had taught through 1 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, at Eastside before leaving. And so our, our last Wednesday night there, I, I finished chapter 11. We got here and started in chapter 12. And so it was kind of a, a, a perfect timing of, of things. And so, uh, but I'm grateful for Greg teaching that class and the wonderful job that he does in so doing. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, this morning... And so if you'll bear with me a little bit, I, I want you, uh, and, and I know not everybody is in here, and some will be able to go back and, and watch later and, and maybe learn a little bit more about the work uh, that we are trying to do with 416 Ministries. Uh, but I want you to see where, where, it's, where it developed, where it came from, and as well to, to see how you might be participating uh, in that as well, because certainly you have. Uh, by training preachers and by helping uh, me to be trained as a gospel preacher. And so, uh, and the encouragement that you've given to, to me and Cindy through the years, we are grateful for that. But that is all a part of 416 Ministries as well. And I want to try to show you how that is the case. But I want us to begin in Ephesians chapter 4 and just kind of lay out the chapter for just a moment leading up to chapter 4 and verse 16, which is where obviously Ephesians 4.16 is, is kind of the, the jumping off point, if you will, for our, our ministry. But in the beginning of this chapter, after spending so much time talking about God's plan to save mankind in the first three chapters, that's what it's discussing, in fact, and, and bringing all of mankind together by uh, both Jews and Gentiles, bringing everybody together in one body, being reconciled unto Christ in one body, chapter 2 taking the law out of the way, bringing forth a new law and setting that before mankind. And, and through that, through the body of Christ, all can be in unity with one another, both Jews and Gentiles. All mankind can be in unity with one another and be in unity with God. Ultimately, going back to chapter 1, that's the plan to save mankind. But in chapter 3, at the end of that chapter... He says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Verse 20, To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The glory that we get to, if you will, lift up toward God. The place that has been, has been made available to do that is the church through Jesus Christ. And then we get into chapter 4, and, and the, though it really kind of continues on in, we haven't left the idea and that theme of unity. He's actually going to uh, really kind of hammer down on that idea about the body of Christ being unified. And, and we know that uh, he, he begins there, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then there's one body, one Spirit, as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. And we know we call it the, the platform of unity, if you will, the, the seven ones that are listed there, and, and, and rightfully so. They set, the, they set the tone for everything that, that we are in Christ as the church, right? And then he talks about spiritual gifts. Of course, we pick up a, a, certainly a, a first century context of spiritual gifts, those things that, that were given, the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 7, when he ascended on high, led captivity captive, he gave gifts to men. And then he talks about that for just a moment. And then he gave some to apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And then we get into the why, verse 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. 
till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And the reason that I wanted to connect that, Greg mentioned this passage uh, in, his, in his last class from chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, because it is, it is certainly parallel. It's talking about those very same things. This is why the spiritual gifts were given. We see that, that context of the first century. The Bible is not yet written, completed, so we don't have that yet. And so you see that, that phrase in Ephesians, till we all come to the unity of the faith. In other words, the completed revelation as per 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8 and following. That discussion picks up there. And so he says that we should no longer be tossed, or as children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, he says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Verse 16 is, is really kind of where, where this in, in, in our mind, as we began to develop this idea about going and in, in edifying congregations, working not in a local setting, but trying to, to work in a, in a kingdom setting, if you will, to be able to, to help congregations, to be able to build up congregations, something that, that seems to be lacking in different ways. And we'll talk about how uh, certainly that work will come about. But I, I want us to, to think about a couple of things from this, this passage for just a moment. Joined and knit together. This is um, the puzzle piece. You see the puzzle pieces in the background of our logo and all of that. Part of the reason for that is the puzzle piece has kind of been a, a staple of our work. Uh, something that uh, Cindy actually came up with years ago and we, we kind of put it together. A lot of times the, the first uh, sermon of the year I would talk about uh, and, and this has been over the last 15 years at least uh, that we've been doing this, but I, I would preach a lesson talking about, especially you know, thinking about a new year and new beginnings and things like that. I would talk about how we need, to, we need to find our place. We need to get connected, and we would use the puzzle piece. In fact, we literally would go and buy a new puzzle, and we would hot glue pins on the back of it so that we could pin it up you know, on our lapels and things like that, and uh, we would write Ephesians 4.16 on that puzzle piece. And so it's something we've been doing for years. And, and, and the reason for that is, is to try to encourage people to get connected. When I think about the work of the church, and I think about what Paul is discussing here, obviously, I'm going to take it out of that first century context, but we have the Word of God. Why? So that we can be built up in the most holy faith, so that we can then go and edify others, so that we can do the work of serving and ministering to others, truthing, literally, speaking the truth in love, literally, truthing in love is, it would be from the original there. The idea to, to go out and to spread the gospel. So you have kind of all parts of this, both thinking about within the body of Christ and even outside of the body of Christ trying to reach others. The idea of edifying the body of Christ in love. And so the puzzle piece was something that just kind of naturally kind of came about it works, being knit and joined together in that way. Just it, it was a puzzle piece in our mind. Now, if you ask me if I like putting together puzzles, I do not. Um, I like breaking them down and you know, putting them together in a way that, that I, can, I can wear it down here on my lapel or something like that. But now we've just got these fancy ones made, and that's, that's much better for me. I don't like putting puzzles together. But in a sense, as far as you know, cardboard puzzles... But in a sense, what we are trying to do is to knit the church together and knit members of the church together. Part of this has to do with being the family of God, the household of God, 1 Timothy 3, 15. The idea of, of bringing people together who are already brought together in Christ but need to find a way to work together, need to find a way to, to encourage one another. Uh, let, let's face it, in this, in this life, this life is difficult. There are a lot of things going on. Everything is fast-paced. There, there's so much happening around us. It's easy to kind of get 
uh, if you will, swept away into all that going on around us and forget who we are and where we are and what we're supposed to be doing, right, with one another as the family of God. And so if we can find our place in the kingdom, if we can find our place in the local work, get connected. And this is certainly where I think about, I think about elders and the work in which they're involved in, in trying to not just oversee everything going on and to watch for our souls, but to, but to help, if you will, plug us into those places where our talents can be used and where we can benefit others and where we might encourage someone and where we might be able to lead in a certain way or, or where we just we find our, our place. And there's so much to do in the Lord's church. We just need to be working to do that. And so, uh, again, this is, this is where all this comes about from Ephesians chapter 4. And so, when I think about the, the puzzle piece, it was just kind of a natural uh, outgrowth, if you will, of what we were already doing uh, in that way. And, and one of the things when, when conceptually this kind of started coming to our mind um, really almost two years ago, at least a year and a half ago now, uh, you know, this is something that we thought this is something we'll do yet in, in the future and thought, okay, when we get out of local work at some point in the future, um, I've got enough gray hair to start thinking about that, right? And then and so we get to, we get to that point whenever that is, where we were going to get out of local work, maybe, and, and, and start thinking about some of these things. Well, this would be a good thing to do. And, and then that concept became a reality, and it was like, okay, catch up, this is happening. And, uh, and, and so it, it began to move really quickly. And so, uh, and so we're still, in some ways, just trying to get caught up uh, with what's going on. And so leaving local work, for me, as a personal note, is, is kind of a, a sad thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited at the same time because I, I think this is a work that is needed and something that uh, maybe we will be able to benefit the kingdom in, in, some, in some different ways. Uh, and, and so if we can help uh, in, in the church, that's certainly what we want to do. So let's think about our, our vision. Let me share this with you. Ultimately, build up the kingdom where it's weak. In our travels of the last uh, 10 years, I would say, we have seen places where, geographically speaking, the Lord's church is weak. And you've traveled enough around the country, you know that to be the case. There are certain areas where the church is just not, where there's not a congregation. Places where the congregations are hours apart from one another. And some of that has to do geographically with, with, with you know, especially you go out west and everything's kind of spread out anyway. But you can go up in the northeast and it's the same story. And there's a lot more, lot more people up there, a lot more opportunity to reach folks. Uh, and yet the church seems to be very weak in some of those areas. So geographically speaking, uh, we know that to be the case. And so we're going to be looking for opportunities to, to be able to strengthen those congregations that are in those areas. And then certainly looking for ways that we might be able to plant congregations uh, in some of those areas as well. And our connection to working alongside of the, the MIP School of Preaching, we certainly have a connection and, and a source there, a resource for us, where uh, we can say, okay, well, this is an area, and, and we, with the World Missions Program, and, and we have some that are going to be doing stateside mission work, uh, we'll be able to hopefully connect some with saying, okay, well, this is an area, and we can research in that area for a time and set up studies and build and, and things like that and kind of help maybe do some of the groundwork and helping and connecting other people to that area and that particular work. And so that's, that's certainly something, geographically speaking, that we want to do. Spiritually speaking, it's, it's kind of the same story. As you travel about, uh, you find that there are congregations that, spiritually speaking, are weak. Not just geographically where they're located, but where they are spiritually, doctrinally. And, and so we want to help strengthen and encourage and, and build up in some of those areas as well. And so that's, that's kind of our, our, our broad and main vision uh, in, in this particular work. So the mission to edify and to encourage preachers and families, um, they're on the front line, so to speak. And so, uh, and, and I mentioned that the other night uh, at, the, at the graduation to our, our graduating class. 
uh, they're out there, they're on the front lines, and so they're, they're, we want to keep them encouraged. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a moment. But we want to build relationships between the, the school and congregations to encourage that support for preachers. And, and so we, we we're going to, obviously, we're, we're building relationships with congregations as we travel about and, and kind of becoming a, a pipeline, if you will, of information between the school and, and preachers maybe that are looking, congregations that are looking, and also congregations that are looking maybe to mentor or give a, an internship maybe for two years or three years after some of our younger students maybe leave uh, the Memphis School of Preaching. Some of them come in at, at 18 years old. Uh, this is the reality of things. And leave here after two years, graduating at 20 years old. And, and you know as well as I do that uh, they don't have a whole lot of world experience, obviously. And, and so they, they need a little bit of time. And so what happens a lot of times is our preachers go out at, at that point and they go to some of the small congregations and they are put into positions Sometimes in these congregations, especially the spiritually weak congregations, these young men are allowed to almost become or pushed into positions where they become pastors of congregations rather than just the preacher. And we know the distinction. We understand that. And that shouldn't be the case, but that's what happens so many times. And these young men are certainly not ready for that and, and maybe are not aware how to even have seen that coming. And then all of a sudden they're in that position and, and I've seen it happen over and over. Maybe you've experienced that or seen that happen. And then two or three years down the road, guess what? That young man's not preaching anymore. And, and that's the saddest part of, of all of this, the reality of this. And so we want to, we want to help that if we can to, to try to reach some congregations and, and connect preachers in that kind of situation as well. And so ultimately we want to plant, we want to help water in some places, and, and we're going to be praying for laborers in every place. And so uh, we'd ask you to, to certainly partner with us in, in that way as well. So these are things that we can certainly be doing together. Let's look together for a moment at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, be ready, in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine or teaching. Be ready. Well, this is what the school, this is the work of the school. This is what the school is doing, training these men to be ready, right? To go out. And, and to, with that charge, to go out and to preach the gospel, to preach the truth, to be ready to do so, to be prepared, to be eager, yes, but ultimately to be prepared to do so. And the school does a great job, and I am thankful for it. And I know you are as well as, as supporters of the school. But what about on the other side of this? You see, when I start looking at, at the next verses here, verses 3 through 5, Here's what follows. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Where these men go out and preach, and they've been prepared to do so, and they're going to do so. They're going to give their heart to this work. They're going to preach their hearts out, so to speak. But the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, Paul says to Timothy. According to their own desires, because they have itching ears, They'll heap to themselves teachers. They'll turn their ears away from the truth. They'll be turned aside unto fables. So they're just going to be out there wanting and listening to myths, fables. That's what they're going to want to hear with itching ears. But he says to Timothy, Be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And what I... What I get out of this and how I, how I kind of see this working together, you have the school that is training and preparing and getting these men ready to go out, and then they're out in the field. What can we do to help them stay in the field? Preacher retention. This is, part of, this is a, a huge part, if you will, 
of the work in which we're involved and why it, it has made so much sense for us to be partnered with the Memphis School of Preaching in this way. And, and, and so very thankful again for that opportunity. But I think about, think about the, all of the, the preachers who have come through the school through the years. Many of them, many of them have gone to their reward, from the, a lot of those from those early classes. But many of them have also left the pulpit. Now, it's fair to say, and we should make note of this, that some come with the desire to learn how to do that, but never really are, are planning to be in the pulpit full time. But they, they want the training, they, they want the Bible knowledge, and they, they want to study themselves, prepare themselves so that they can teach classes, so that they can preach when they get the opportunity, so that they can do other parts of the ministry, but they're, they're preparing themselves. And, and great, wonderful, because not everybody needs to be in the pulpit. That, that sounds harsh when I said it that way, but that's, that's not how I meant it exactly. But some men, they don't desire to be in the pulpit full time. And maybe it's the case that some don't need to be in the pulpit full time. But there's so much that can be done. So many works that need to be done. And we need to be trained. The better trained in the Bible, the better prepared, the stronger the congregation, right? It's all about strengthening congregations. It's about building up congregations. And so this is, this is all part, if you will, of that, that work together. And so this is where Cindy and I want to help both preachers and congregations. We, we want to help keep preachers preaching. And so we, we want to, to have congregations kind of partnering with us uh, to do this work and, and to, to support others and to, and to help others in this way. And, and so this is, this is where it's all kind of come about. So when I think about what every preacher deals with, in, in verses 3 and 4 especially start working that out, but in verse 5 he says, you need to endure it. You need to hang in there, right? And, and that's, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, Paul tells Timothy, by inspiration, hang in there. Keep on preaching, right? But sometimes preaching feels alone. We feel by ourselves. And in some areas, geographically speaking, thinking about congregations that are weak ge geographically, they are alone. They, they have no circle they, you know, of, of people around them. And, and sometimes elders and congregations are wonderful, and, and they, they bring those people in, and they, they love those preachers, and they, 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 just, they make them part of that family, and, and that's, that's so lovely, and that's the way that it should be. You know where I'm about to go, right? That's not always the way it is. That's not the reality of things, unfortunately. Because people are people, right? And so we need to encourage these preachers. And, and that's, that's what this work really, uh, a good portion of this work is, is really about doing that. When I think about congregational help and, and some of the works we're going to be doing, I know uh, some of this might not be able to be read uh, by, by some, but uh, there's, there's different areas in which we will be working uh, in this work. Uh, sometimes, and, and week to week, this work could look, completely different than last week. And sometimes we might be in a location for three or four weeks, and so we are, we're, we're invested there with time and effort, and, and, and we're doing several different things while we're there. Uh, and so sometimes it might just be fill-in preaching. Sometimes it might just be randomly stopping into a congregation just to say, hey. And the reason that I say that is because years ago, when I first started preaching, I was in Homerville, Georgia, and it was my first work, and it's where I obeyed the gospel, small congregation down in South Georgia in the edge of the swamp. And, you know, the work, though there are congregations around, again, sometimes the work, you feel a little alone in the work. And so uh, if, if somebody would have been driving through town or something like that or, or coming through on 441 south through Homerville, Georgia, and said, called me and said, hey, Wayne, I'm going to be in town in about an hour. I want to stop by and see you, see how you're doing. I want to take you to lunch I want, or take you to breakfast, go buy you a cup of coffee, whatever. I want, to, I want to hear about your family. I want to hear about your work. I want to hear what's going on in your life. I just, it, you know what that would have done for me? That would have been such a shot in the arm, right? 
that, that B12 shot that just keeps you going, right? For a little bit further. Go a little bit more, right? Just, just need a little bit more. And, and, and that, that's what we want to do for folks, is, is to try to help, to help encourage. And everybody needs that. And so sometimes just stopping into a congregation can do that. We visited a little small congregation in East Tennessee this past week uh, where Matthew and Olivia are now attending. And, and they were so excited when we walked in. We got there before Matthew and Olivia, and, and so they didn't know right off the bat that we were connected to them, and they were just, everybody's meeting us at the door because it's a small congregation, and, you know, they don't get that many visitors. And so they were just, they loved it, you know, and you could just see that it just kind of, you know, you could see it on their face. It encouraged them. And I know how that is, working in small congregations through a good portion of our ministry. That, that, that's a big deal. And so certainly we want to help doing that, encourage where we can in that way. Sometimes I'll be filling in uh, in different places, uh, and sometimes when we're in town here, filling in and, and things like that as well. Gospel meetings, seminars, different things that we can do, leadership uh, seminars, evangelism type seminars, and even, even edification seminars. This is something that I'm, I'm putting together right now, ways that the congregation can edify, can build up itself. And so I'm trying to put together a series of lessons right now so that that can be set up even as, as a series uh, to actually go in and, and kind of do a weekend seminar in that fashion. And so that's, that's part of the work that we're going to be doing. Of course, Cindy's available for ladies' days and, and classes, ladies' classes and things like that. Uh, as we're traveling about some of these geographical areas where the church is not located and yet it's a growing area, We'll, be, we'll, plant our, we'll you know, plant ourselves for a little while. We'll do some research. We'll try to set up some Bible studies and see, uh, see what we can do there in that area. And we may have to, to move on and go to another location, but we'll be coming back there and, and hit it again and, and try to do that. And those will be those areas that we will be kind of marking on the map as mission points to be able to connect that with, with other preachers that may want to go there. And so... Uh, and, of course, all of this we'll be putting out by way of social media, YouTube channel, uh, sometimes live, uh, you know, on our social medias and things like that, where we can talk about a certain area and, and what's in that area uh, as well. And so church planning certainly will be a part of that. Campaign work, uh, sometimes going in, <clears throat> even if I'm not preaching the gospel meeting, sometimes it can be the case that we could uh, connect with a gospel meeting that's going on and go in a week ahead of time and, and plant there. And of course, uh, it's, it's easy for us to do to go into an area. We've got our camper, we'll be set up somewhere, and so we're not, no cost to any congregation or anything like that. And, but go in and, and ahead of a gospel meeting, go and try to set up studies and go and try to you know, work with that congregation to hand out flyers and whatever they're doing marketing-wise uh, to advertise. And then be there for that week if we can to encourage we could even stay a week after and continue uh, to set up studies and, and to do some follow-up even afterwards and to help the preacher do that in, in those congregations. And so that's, that's going to be part of you know, what we're um, allowing ourselves time to do as we're traveling about. And so we're, we'll be planning those things. Um, one of the things that we implemented uh, a couple years ago at the Eastside Congregation in Maryville, Tennessee, was a, a full summer Bible school. And, and so, uh, and we've had some interest in that. And so we'll be talking to congregations about summer Bible school and what that looks like instead of a week VBS. Uh, some of those activities happen all summer naturally anyway. And so just kind of connecting those things by a theme, putting them together and having the classes uh, work all summer long, that whole quarter um, to be a little more VBS oriented uh, and, but they'll be structured during the same time frame as a Sunday class and a Wednesday class. But then to have some other activities that are done alongside of that, uh, outside of that class period uh, as well. And so Summer Bible School is something that we're uh, excited to kind of talk to congregations about as well. And just something that might work uh, in, in other places as well. And so uh, we get asked the question, well, how can we help? Uh, you'll see a QR code up on the screen. Uh, Forest Hill, you are helping. You, you are tremendously. You're helping us kickstart this work, and, and we're ever thankful for that. We love you for that. That's, that is beyond our, our uh, greatest imagination of how this thing would have ever gotten started. 
uh, but Forest Hill and the Memphis School of Preaching is, is making that happen for us. And so we are excited for that. We're certainly going to be raising funds as well as we go out and to, to lighten that burden, uh, if you will, uh, on the work here. But certainly we, we, want to, we want to put that out there. And so, uh, and because this is being live streamed and, and recorded for later, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about it as, as if you're not already doing that. So bear with me here. So obviously our QR code, it goes to all of our social media links. It goes to ways to donate. Uh, and, and so there's just links to follow digitally. And, and, and that, that's real easy to do. Obviously, checks through the Memphis, uh, Memphis School of Preaching um, is, is another way to, to get money directly to uh, that work. And so we have a fund uh, that, is, that we are uh, adding those to, and that, that's our working fund uh, that, we're, that we're building up. And so uh, that's, that's a way to be able to help. And so much of what this work uh, has been has been because we have worked locally obviously with some congregations and we've we've learned and we've experienced and we've we've had the the lows and we've had the highs and we've had the you just got to keep pressing on pressing on pressing on uh type of years uh as well in ministry as well as you certainly have experienced that in your life and so uh, this is not just always about ministry this is about the christian life it's, it's about we have lows and we have highs and we have those times where we just got to keep putting one foot in front of another and so uh, and, and keep pressing forward and we want to uh, help people to keep doing that we want to build up the church in that way and so we uh, the way that you've encouraged us and helped us we're carrying that to other people uh, as well throughout this good brotherhood you can pray please be prayerful uh, for this work uh, we're, we're grateful to be able to do it but but spend some time pray for uh, preachers, for preachers' families, for preachers' wives. Uh, so often it's the case, we, we talk much about preachers and preaching, but preachers' wives need encouraging as well. And, and so um, for those preachers to keep going, they need their wives to keep going as well, right? Uh, and, and so they're, they're, they're the engine that a lot of times do keep them going. And so they're, they're working right there beside them, and it's, it's difficult and so uh, we want to certainly be prayerful for them and for preaching families. Uh, certainly they go through a, a great deal. Uh, pray for elders, deacons, pray for members, pray for these congregations. Uh, and again, as we are going out, uh, those things we're going to be uh, you know, talking about, like I say, through social media and through our YouTube channel, uh, through a newsletter. And, and so as, as you see those names or hear of congregations where we're visiting and, and working, uh, please add those to your prayer list as well and be praying for those works. Our brotherhood needs it. They need our prayers. And so we, we want to be mindful of that. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that, I, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, we're not ambassadors in chains or anything like that, uh, but we are going forth preaching the Word, and so we covet your prayers, uh, that we would be bold in the work that we're doing, that we would be encouraging to those uh, around us. And so uh, pray without ceasing. Uh, planning. How can you help? Uh, you can help us in planning in this way. Uh, if you know of congregations, and I know you do, of congregations that need encouragement, write that down on a, on a slip of paper. Put your name by it. So if we need more information, uh, write a congregation down, if, an address if you have it, a contact person, uh, and, and, and maybe something about what's going on. And even if you don't get to, to tell me personally about it or tell Cindy about it uh, personally, just hand us a note. Make sure your name's on there, and then we'll get back with you, and we'll find out more information about it and, and try to put it on our schedule so that we can at least go by and just visit and, uh, and, and just say hey and, and, and encourage them in, in whatever way that we possibly can. And so uh, you, can, you can certainly uh, help us in the planning process, uh, and, and, and that's going to be, I think, very beneficial and helpful to us. 
All right, this goes back. We've got just a, a minute or a couple minutes more. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4 with me. <clears throat> Joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. I want to spend the last moment here again bringing it back up about finding our place. I, I know the Amer American Missions campaign that was done here with Brother Rob. I, I know the work that you're trying to do with evangelism that is being done. And, and I am so excited to hear about that. I, I'm so excited to hear about Bible studies taking place and, and all of that. And if you're not involved, find a way. Find a way, and maybe you're not one holding the Bible study, but you could be the encourager. Maybe, maybe, maybe ask someone who's having a Bible study if you could just sit in and, and, and study along and, and see how it's being done. And, and I know there's training in all of that that's, that's taking place, and, and, and maybe you've, you've already sat in on some of that training. Maybe you just need the encouragement. As a Fishers of Men instructor, uh, I've told students through the years, one of the things that you need to do is just do it. <laughs> You've got to start somewhere, right? You've got to get out there. And we talk about the things that hold us back from, from doing that, from being evangelistic, is most of the time fear. False evidence that appears real, right? It, it, I, I've built up something in my mind, so I'm, I'm fearful of what they might ask or what if I say something wrong or whatever the case may be. Fearful of the unknown. You can't let that stop you from doing the Lord's work. Find your place in evangelism. And find your place in edifying. In edifying. When I think about this work that we're doing, I, I, I've never thought, never thought of myself in this way. I don't know if I am <laughs> uh, best fit for it, but I just see that it's a work that needs to be done. And so I'm going to go out and I'm going to do the best that I can. So we're going to go out and do the very best that we can to, to encourage. Because we've been encouraged and we know what that means. And so find your place in encouraging someone around you. We talk about the three works of the church. So benevolence is left. And so I'll just quickly mention that as well as we therefore have opportunity. Let us do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6 and verse 10. Find your place, get connected, be joined, knit together, doing the work of benevolence, helping others with their physical needs, with the things that they have to have right now. Years ago, I, one, of, one of my elders early on, the, in fact, the, the man who taught me the gospel, baptized me into Christ, he used to always say this. He used to always talk about the threefold work of the church. We talk about benevolence, edification, and evangelism, right? He said, but truthfully, it's evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. And we edify one another. Why? So that when we walk out those doors, we evangelize. So that we're ready to evangelize. Because we've been built up and we've encouraged others. Let's go. And then we have those opportunities to benevolent, benevolently, that's easy to say, right? Help someone else with their needs. They have a physical need, and, and, and so those things first have to be met because that's what's on their mind. But so often it is the case that, and you know of situations, and maybe it's been the case with you, you were helped in a certain situation, and that opened the door, if you will, in your heart, in your mind, that you were willing to study. And that someone was willing to, to, to have a Bible study now because they were helped. They were encouraged. And so that's the work of the church. That's the work of the Lord. That's the work of the kingdom. And according to chapter 3 and verse 20 and 21, therein we can glorify God in the church, by Jesus Christ. That's the work that we're involved in. That's the work that I hope you are involved in. I appreciate your time.